Okay. Good morning. I am here to report on critical discourse analysis. I am Michael Demedia Perocho, a PhD in Applied Linguistics student of the University of Mindanao Professional Schools. They say that critical discourse analysis is one of the overly explored fields of linguistics. Well, I should say that in the field of research, most academicians, or most linguists have already explored on critical discourse analysis. And this is one good way for these experts to look at different linguistic phenomena happening in our society. So at this moment, allow me to discuss to you an introduction to critical discourse analysis. CDA, or critical discourse analysis, is discourse analytical research that primarily studies that way social power abuse and inequality are enacted, reproduced, legitimated, and resisted by text and talk in the social and political context. So when we talk about critical discourse analysis, one prime focus here is to look at the social power abuse and inequality happening in the society and how specifically the social power abuse and inequality are being enacted by people involved, reproduced by consumers, legitimated, and even resisted by certain parties in the society. Critical discourse and analysts want to understand, expose, and ultimately challenge social inequality. But this one is in the aspect of linguistics. Well, if you are a social scientist, well, definitely you could look at how social inequality exists in the society in a perspective of different social theories. But if you are a critical discourse analyst, you would look at social inequality as wherein linguistic factors definitely are the primary reasons why this exists in the society. Okay, and other non-linguistic features as well or non-linguistic elements may be considered in the analysis thereof. This is why CDA may be characterized definitely as a social movement of politically committed discourse analysts. Unlike discourse analysis, critical discourse analysis has a more novel cause on why we do this kind of analysis for research purposes. And that is not only to unravel social inequality or to look at to simply look at linguistic phenomena. It's not like that. We look, we try to intertwine linguistics with social science so that we could really understand the social linguistic perspective of the society. One widespread misunderstanding of critical discourse analysis is that it is a special method of doing discourse analysis. Well, when I was in college, I was exposed to critical discourse analysis as a direct branch of critical dis of discourse analysis. However, when I attended various seminars, I was taught that critical discourse analysis should not be treated this way. Experts from the field of linguistics would tell us that critical discourse analysis is separate from discourse analysis, primarily because of the focus or the scope of what are being involved in the study of critical discourse analysis. Actually, there is no such method. In critical discourse analysis, all methods of the cross-discipline of discourse studies, as well as other relevant methods in the humanities and social sciences may be used. And that is why we could consider critical discourse analysis as both interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, primarily because it does not use only linguistic theories or concepts for the analysis of corpora or texts or utterances. In critical discourse analysis, we intertwine it with other social science theories, for example, theories in sociology, political science, even other factors of the society, such as anthropological perspectives or geographical perspectives. Now, all of these are being considered in the study of critical discourse analysis because that is how critical discourse analysis works. If you want to critically analyze a specific discourse, then you have to look at different segments or portions. And looking at the linguistic aspect is not enough. You have to look as well on the different aspects such as sociology or social perspective, political perspective as well, okay? cultural as well may be considered. To avoid this misunderstanding and to emphasize that many methods and approaches may be used in the critical study of text and thought, there is now a more general term called critical discourse studies for the field of research that's according to Von Weig in 2008. So Von Weig in 2008 suggested that 
the use of the term critical discourse analysis may not be enough for language experts or linguists, primarily because it may be understood that critical discourse analysis is under the branch of discourse analysis. So to have a wider perspective or a wider look at critical discourse analysis, we now have this term critical discourse study to encompass not only the study of discourse analysis, but also other social perspectives and other allied fields or theories coming from the allied fields. Now, critical research on this course has the following general properties, among others. <clears throat> First one, it focuses primarily on social problems and political issues rather than the mere study of discourse structures outside of social and political contexts. So when we talk about critical research or critical discourse study, it primarily focuses on social problems and political issues. That is why we try to unravel the use of power through language. This critical analysis of social problems is usually multidisciplinary. So as what I mentioned a while ago, it's not only interdisciplinary, it's also, it's also multidisciplinary because it taps other fields of studies. Rather than merely describe discourse structures, it tries to explain them in terms of properties of social interaction and especially social structure. Now, we know that in society, there are different structures involved. And every structure also has its own linguistic structure or linguistic landscape in terms of language used. And a critical look at this would also enable you to have a wider picture of how social interactions are made or how power abuse could be tolerated by specific speech community through the use of language. So that is the pri primary concern of the critical discourse analysis as a research approach. More specifically, critical discourse analysis focuses on the ways discourse structures enact, confirm, legitimate, reproduce, or challenge relations of power, abuse, or dominance in society. So this is one of the things being looked at in a critical discourse study because we need to discover as well how power, abuse, or dominance, or power generally is manipulated in the society through the use of language. Fairclough and Wodak in 1997 summarized the main tenets of critical discourse analysis, and these are as follows. First one, critical discourse analysis addresses social problems. So as defined a while ago by several authorities in the field, critical discourse analysis points out to a specific social problem. And it does not only identify the grassroots level problem, but it also provides a solution to these social problems. But of course, with the use of the linguistic lens. Second one, power relations are discursive. For example, in, an, in a hierarchical structure or in a structure of authority and power, we look at it as if we look at it through dominance, we look at it through how leadership or authority is being manipulated by the person at the top level, and how this leadership or authority is enforced to the members under that person. However, we need to remember as well that it's not only about power relations, it's also discursive in nature. Because the way you show your leadership, the way you show your power, your position towards, let's say, your substituents, definitely is through discourses. And uttering these discourses will reflect the authority or the power that you have or the power that you hold given the structure that you have in the society or in an organization. Discourse constitutes society and culture. Now, we know that discourse primarily is affected by our social and cultural background. For one person, this is how he or she deals a specific structure in the society. And this might probably be caused by his or her social and cultural background. Discourse does ideological work as well. One interesting fact about critical discourse analysis is that we look at ideologies, the underlying themes of power, beliefs, principles, authority. All of these are form part of the critical discourse study. And we should always remember that discourse does always this ideological work. Because if you simply say discourse analysis 
Well, you simply look at the linguistic structures, the different patterns of language used in a specific utterance or discourse. But when we, take, when we say critical discourse analysis, it's already a different story because you look not only at the discourse structures or the patterns of language, but also at the ideologies underlying these discourses or utterances. Discourse is also historical. Well, it's also very important that you trace back to history why that specific discourse was said or delivered in that way. For example, when you look at the speeches of the Philippine presidents, and then you critically analyze the utterances or discourses used in the speeches by these presidents, you also need to look at the historical context. Maybe there could be a reason why that Philippine president used such diction or choice of words in his or her speech delivery because it might be bounded by the given context or situation during the delivery of the speech or the discourse. So that is why discourse is really historical. And then the link between text and society is also mediated. It's mediated because there is something that is in between text and society. And they are the ideologies that are present within the body of texts. Okay? Discourse analysis is also interpretative and explanatory. Because when you say discourse analysis, it looks at the text only. But when you say critical discourse analysis, you have to have a good or substantial interpretation and explanation of how text is produced, reproduced, and consumed by people. And lastly, discourse is a form of social action. Well, we know that discourse is one of the prime ways on how we could air out our sentiments, express our ideas, reflect our ideologies. And discourse is actually a powerful tool for us to understand not only one's personality, but also the social phenomena happening around us. I should say that with the recent happenings in our country or in our world right now, I think discourse has played an important role. For example, the recent shutdown of, of ABS-CBN due to numerous violations, violations of the law. Discourse was primarily used by artists and employees of ABS-CBN to vent their emotions, to express their sentiments against the Philippine government, which decided to have the company closed. And discourse there in the context of, for example, rallies, media appearance, has become a tool for them to show that they have this sort of social action, that they have this sort of restraint against the government to show that they have words against the government because of the closure of abs cbn okay so these are the tenets or main tenets of critical discourse analysis according to fairclough and Wodak in 1997. now let's talk about conceptual and theoretical frameworks since critical discourse analysis is not a specific direction of research, it does not have a unitary theoretical framework. So we cannot definitely say that once we conduct a critical discourse study, automatically we use a singular approach only. It's not like that. As what I mentioned a while ago, it is multidisciplinary, hence you need to tap other fields, specifically their concepts and their theories, to bolster your discussion or to create let's say, a meaningful and substantial explanation of how text or discourse is produced, reproduced, and consumed by the participants involved in the research. So the typical vocabulary of many scholars in critical discourse analysis will feature such notions as power, dominance, hegemony, ideology, class, gender, race, discrimination, interests, reproduction, institution, social structure, and social order. So if you look at it, critical discourse analysis is very broad because it has many extents. When you say it, ha it is very broad, that means you have a lot of considerations. For example, if you would like to study the language use of, of the gays, we know that we have the lavender linguistics, we have queer linguistics, but studying power relations in the structure or the institution of the LGBT community may be critically examined through the use of critical discourse analysis. 
because we look here not only LGBT community as a power structure or as a structure containing different ideologies. We look at LGBT community as a community of discrimination, of gender, of interest as well, language for production, dominance if there is any, and as well as an institution in the society. And hence, if that is the case, then we need to consider as well other theoretical underpinnings looking at social perspectives okay, or anthropological perspectives may be used as well. Language use, discourse, verbal interaction, and communication belong to the micro level of the social order. Okay, so we have two levels of analysis here, the micro level and the macro level. So when you say micro level of social order or micro level analysis, we look only at the language use, the discourse, the verbal interaction, the communication, the patterns of utterance delivery. But when you say macro level analysis, we are talking of, of power, dominance, and inequality between social groups, of course, through the micro level elements, language use, discourse, and others. And what's unique about critical discourse analysis is that we have to make sure that there is a good balance between macro and micro level analysis for you to really understand the use of discourses in a text or the use of discourses by certain individuals. And because of this, we could say that critical discourse analysis must bridge the well-known gap between micro and macro approaches. So we could not say that it should only be micro level of analysis because it refers to discourse analysis alone. And if we look at power, dominance, and quality analysis only, then definitely that might be political or social in nature. So once we intertwine two, we interweave the two, two elements or levels of analysis, micro and macro, then we get to have this critical discourse analysis where we fully understand the nature of the language used, the context, and how it is consumed by the people involved. Okay, so as what I mentioned, we have macro and micro levels of analysis. Now, there are several ways to analyze and bridge the societal macro and micro gap, gap to arrive at unified critical analysis. First one, we look at members or groups. Language users engage in discourse as members of several social groups, organizations, or institutions, and conversely, groups thus may act by or through their members. And we could look at critical discourse analysis in this context by looking at how language users engage with people through the use of language and how the group uses its members through the use of language in order for them to reflect power or authority within the specified group okay next one is action process social acts of individual actors are thus constituent parts of group actions and social processes such as legislation news making or the reproduction of racism for example when we talk about legislation and news making we know to be specific let's say news making we know that when we make news such as headlines there is this specific framing that we follow and this action or process of framing may directly affect also the different ideologies reflected in the discourse or the body of text okay third is context social structure situations of discursive interaction are similarly part or constitutive of social structure for example a press conference may be a typical local practice of organizations in media institutions as macro level structures that is local and more global context are closely related and both exercise constraints on discourse another example would be the use of social media if we are in let's say in a casual or physical conversation with people let's say our friends well making jokes could be acceptable however it will be a different story once you make a joke about a certain group of people or a certain minority through a video uploaded on facebook or youtube so the context of the social structure here gives you the constraints on discourse usage. The discourse that you will use or the discourse that you use when you physically converse with a person or with a group of people is totally different from the discourse that you should use with social media language or social media discourses. So that is context social structure. The structure in terms of context or the social, the social, the, the society, okay, the community 
or the space where you are delivering the discourse may also affect the structure of power and authority or the discourse used. And then we also have personal and social cognition. Language users or social actors have both personal and social cognition, let's say personal memories, knowledge, and opinions, as well as those shared with members of a group or culture as a whole. This is now going to boil down to the uniqueness or the peculiarities of a person, for example, of a personality. Okay? Through critical discourse analysis, definitely we could also unravel the type of personality a person possesses. Not only that, we could also understand how a person manipulates power or authority through the use of language. That is, through both micro and macro levels of analysis. You study the discourse patterns and at the same time you look at the ideologies used or reflected by that person. Now, a central notion in most critical work on discourse is that of power, and more specifically, the social power of groups or institutions. So when we say critical discourse analysis, definitely it looks at power usage. But it's not just any other power there existing in the society. We are talking about social power here of different groups and institutions. So it may be political or religious. It may be educational. Okay? Or it may be a simple communal power. Okay, power use in a specific community or a spe specific speech community. Social power is defined in terms of control. That's according to Von Zeg in 2008. Thus, groups have more or less power if they are able to more or less control the acts and minds of members of other groups. For example, if you are a Philippine president or let's say another government official, high-ranking official, let's say a senator, and when you deliver a speech through media, it might have a total difference. When you deliver, for example, you're the senator, you actually deliver the lines to a person in front of you. The media exposure there would prompt you that you need to, of course, use the best words that you could use because not only one person will consume the discourse that you are releasing through media. The entire nation might be able to listen or hear to or hear your discourses. And so, there should be, you should be very careful with the choice of words that you release through media. It's a totally different story when you personally converse with a person wherein you could use any word that you can use when expressing your sentiments or emotions towards that person. Okay? So, it's just about social power as a control or as a means of control in a given um, institution or group of individuals. Now, this ability um, presupposes as well a power base of privilege access to scarce social resources such as force, money, status, fame, knowledge, information, culture, or various forms of public discourse and communication. And the power of dominant groups may be integrated in laws, rules, norm, habits, norms, habits, and even a quite general consensus and thus take the form of hegemony. That's according to Gramsci in 1971. Well, we could definitely say that power is not always exercised in obviously abusive acts of dominant group members, but it may be enacted in a myriad taken for granted actions of everyday life, for example, gestures. You could also understand whether or not, for example, a person is deceiving you, not only through the use of discourse or through the use of power or um, discourse manipulation or control, but also through the use or the, the observance or the observation rather of of the different gestures used by that person. Now, these gestures could be reflective of the ideologies of that person, okay? So, there could be minute details that should be considered when doing critical discourse analysis because critical discourse analysis is not only about speech patterns, it may also be about non-linguistic or paralinguistic elements. For the analysis of the relations between discourse and power, there is a need to find that access to specific forms of discourse. For example, those of politics, media, education, or science, or definitely it's in itself, it's a power resource. Okay? And action is controlled by our minds. And so understanding discourse analysis or understanding discourse through critical discourse analysis will also help us understand action and consequently understand minds of people. 
Now, the issue of discursive power may be split into three interrelated questions for critical discourse analysis research. First one, how do powerful groups control the text and context of public discourse? Now, we assume that with the use of discourse here, a powerful body of discourse, these groups definitely are powerful enough because they could manipulate someone else's mind through the use of discourse. And it is presumably true that these groups who are trying to tweak, modify, adjust context and text of public discourse have, are reflective or evident of power, social power as well, or institutional power. Second one, how does such power discourse control the minds and actions of less powerful groups or the minority? And what are the social consequences of such control such as social inequality? Okay. And the third question would be, what are the properties of discourse of powerful groups, institutions or organizations? And these properties may remain referred to both linguistic and non-linguistic properties. And you should also ask, how are such properties forms of power abuse? Or if not, how are these properties used to, to show or reflect power abuse in a certain institution, group, or society? Now, if controlling the context and structures of text and talk is the first major form of the exercise of power, controlling people's minds through such discourse is an indirect but fundamental way to reproduce dominance and hegemony, okay, or dominance in a specific group of people. Now, discourse control usually aims at controlling the intentions, the plans, the knowledge, opinions, attitudes, and ideologies, as well as the consequent actions of the recipients. So when you say there is this so-called power abuse or power manipulation, the, the key thing here is that through the use of discourse, this discourse maker is trying to change the action, the mentality, the knowledge, the opinions, the behavior or the perceptions or perspectives of the recipient or recipients. And so, critical discourse analysis will help us understanding the very reasons why the discourse maker use such linguistic or non-linguistic properties in the discourse so as to create a different impact or effect to or on the recipient or recipients. Now, cognition is the necessary interface that links discourse as language use and social interaction with social situations and social structures. It's according to Von Dijk in 2008. And cognition here will also help us fully understand how discourse is being linked to social interaction. Okay, because we know that the use of discourse could also have a direct impact or it could also be considered a factor on how social interactions are made or perpetuated in a given society. The episodic memory represents people's personal experiences as multimodal mental models. In communication and interaction, mental models, also called the situation models, are the subjective representation of the events, action, or situation a discourse is about. And hence, such models have a referential semantic nature. And this will also unravel through critical discourse analysis the different experiences that the discourse maker has. If discursive control over the mental models of recipients is in the best interest of the speakers or writers and against the best interest of the recipients, now there is an instance of discursive power abuse usually called manipulation, termed by Von Dijk or mentioned by Von Dijk in 2006. Okay, so if mental models are definitely adjusted, tweaked, modified, or controlled by a specific group of person for specific sort of interest, then there is already manipulation or power abuse. And that is now the subject for critical discourse analysis. Besides the contextual influences on interpretation, critical discourse analysis especially focuses on the ways discourse structures may influence specific mental models in general and generic representations of the recipients. Examples of these structures are, for example, we have headlines and leads okay, for news, implications and presuppositions in conversations, the use of metaphors, also lexical expressions. Even the structuring, the passivization of sentences would also have an effect, and as well as the nominalizations. Let's talk about headlines and leads. 
Headlines and use of news reports express semantic macrostructures or main topics as defined by the journalist and may thus give rise to preferred mental models. A demonstration may thus be defined as a violation of the social order or as a democratic right of the demonstrators. Similarly, a violent attack may be defined as a form of resistance against the abuse of state of power or, or of state power or as a form of terrorism. Now, we have been very aware of these bias news or fake news happening online or existing online or proliferated through various forms of media. And the way these people craft their headlines or their leads definitely is misleading. So critical discourse analysis comes into play when we analyze how headlines are turned into misleading statements, how people consume headlines, their reactions towards it, and how writers craft their headlines as regards to intentions or motives. And if we look at it, we are actually creating an overall look, an overall digging on how headlines and leads are created, reproduced, or proliferated on various forms of media, not only by discourse maker, but also by other people such as audience or recipients of the discourse or the message. Okay. We also have implications and presuppositions such as in conversations. There are powerful semantic properties of discourse that aim to obliquely assert facts that may not be true, as when politicians and the media refer to the violence of demonstrators or the criminality of minorities. For example, the indirectness in statements that may be looked at as a topic or subject under critical discourse analysis, most especially if the indirectness with the use of the language already affects how power is manipulated or how power is controlled in a specific institution or society. Metaphors are also powerful means to make abstract mental models more concrete. Thus, the abstract notion of immigration may be made more concrete and hence more threatening by using metaphors such as waves of immigrants thus creating fear of drowning in immigrants among the other citizens. Okay, the use of metaphors and other um, double-speak languages such as inflated language, euphemism, jargons, and gobbledygook statements will have a different effect once used in discourses. And the way people consume this discourse wherein metaphors and other forms of double-speak are used in a specific discourse, then definitely it will have a different impact or understanding or impression on the end of the recipients or other people consuming the discourse. We also have lexical expression. So the lexical expression of mental models in the discourse of powerful speakers may influence not only knowledge, but also opinions in the mental models of our recipients. So thus, Immigrants may be labeled as illegal or undocumented in political discourse, influencing public opinion on immigration. So either you use euphemism or inflated language. So the choice of words, the lexical expression, the manner or the approach on how you express words here, the diction, definitely will have an effect or impact on how mental models are created or manipulated. Okay, And thus, here comes the play of power or authority which is basically used as a means to change the mental models of the recipients. We also have passivization and nominalization. These may be used to hide or downplay the violent or other negative actions of state agents, military police, or in groups. Okay? This media or political discourse may speak about discrimination without being very explicit about who discriminates against whom. For example, the statement, the statement, 56 families were given help during the COVID quarantine period. If that is the statement, it's definitely passive in nature, right? So we try to downplay, as a matter of fact, we are not acknowledging the person or the body that um, gave such help or assistance to these people affected by the pandemic or quarantine. But if we state, let's say, government, President Rodrigo Duterte and other senators give help or assistance to 
people affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So if that is the case, clearly we can say that it's the doer of the action that give the job. And so the recognition or the acknowledgement of such wonderful actions need to be or attributed rather to the doer of the action based on the discourse. But again, it depends on the institution or the group that produces the discourse. Okay, so the passivization and even the nominalization have effects on how mod how discourses are to be understood. So this time we have the schema of the discursive discursive reproduction of power. So we start with the social structure, powerful groups, institutions, symbolic elites, and then we have the communicative events, which includes the communicative situation. So you need to analyze the communicative situation. And here, for you to analyze communicative situation, you need to go to the nitty gritty, the details, such as the discourse structures. But you have to take into account as well other factors such as setting, time or place, participants, their identities, roles, relations, goals, knowledge, and ideologies, and even the social action in the speech act. Okay? And then the third element that needs to be considered is the personal and social cognition. Okay? So we have here the personal context model and the personal situation model. So we have social attitudes, the ideologies of the people involved, the sociocultural knowledge. You could also trace back the historical background okay? so that you could, you could have a substantial discussion on the use of discourse. Okay? So that is how we analyze um, discourses through critical discourse analysis with focus on mind control. Now, social power may also be locally enacted by the very properties of discourse of, for example, members of powerful groups. Studies of social style have paid extensive attention to the way language and discourse may vary and index power differences between speakers and recipients, such as morphology or word formation. Okay, the lexicon, the pronoun usage, he, she, or we. For example, if you most of the time, if you're the speaker and then you use we, us, then that means you are inclusive of yourself. But when you say them, they, he, or she, third person point of view, then definitely you are only talking about the other party, not including yourself. Okay, and through that, you could also see that there could be a play of power, okay, or the use of words or discourse may be. You, or might have been used as a tool for you to suggest power manipulation or power dominance. Syntax and lexicon, as what I mentioned as well a while ago, the use of metaphors, storytelling, and exchanges of conversations. Okay, And this is going to be the last slide for my report. This one is Fair Club's three-dimensional framework. This one is for critical discourse analysis. Okay. So we have here, first one, description with the text analysis, which also follows interpretation in your process. And then lastly, you explain. Okay, that is now the social analysis. So first, you really need to start with description or text analysis, wherein you need to look at the linguistic and non-linguistic elements of the structure, okay, or the discourse. And then afterwards, you need to interpret it process everything that you have found from the text or the discourse. And then afterwards, explain it depending on the social or historical context. Okay? And generally, we could say that there are three levels. So text is the inner box. And then we have the discourse practice or the text production and consumption, how this is being consumed by people or recipients of the discourse. And then how it is gener generated, reproduced, or proliferated in the society as a matter of social cultural practice. So, if you do critical discourse analysis, you look at not only one dimension, but three dimensions. You look first at the text or discourse, looking for signals or signs of um, both linguistic and non linguistic elements, depending on the focus that you would like to have. And then you look at the process. Or, I mean, you have to have the interpretation, you have to process your analysis, and then lastly would be explanation, you create a substantial or meaningful discussion on how the discourse was used historically or socially speaking. Okay, so that ends my report. I hope everything was clearly explained. So should you have questions, you, uh, I am always ready to, to answer the questions through email or 
Messenger. Thank you very much for listening. Again, I am Michael Benedia Torocho, a Doctor of Philosophy and Applied Linguistics student of the University of Mindanao Professional Schools.